Good day, good evening uh, to everyone present. We welcome you on behalf of Jammu and Kashmir Policy Institute and our um, partnering in organizations, Afghan Women Welfare and Development Association, Winds of Creativity and the Euphrates Institute. Today we are gathered here in order to um, bring together a discussion on a very important topic, uh, which is gender-based violence, something that pervades our daily life in many different ways, in different dimensions. And today is all about um, discussing and deliberating on each of those aspects, uh, going into its depths and bringing about, um, you know, uh, all the ideas and inputs that we can gather from our expert panelists, and also from our participants who are enthusiastic to provide inputs, we'll put together all of them in a session's report. Now, before we begin, uh, I would like to just lay out a few uh, ground rules and the basic format of how we are going to proceed with this. So uh, we are going to uh, have this uh, entire forum in two different parts, which is the first part is going to be the plenary. The plenary is going to be about the panel discussion. And uh, post the plenary, we are going to move into breakout rooms on each of the different topics. And uh, you will be given five minutes to sign up for which breakout room interests you more so you and where you want to put in your inputs. And these breakout rooms are going to be like uh, mini working groups. They are going to be dialogues along the lines of the prompts, which we gather from the panel discussions. Uh, we would request you to please keep yourself muted so that our panelists don't face any difficulty in sharing what they have to. If you have to provide an input, a feedback, any reflection, you will have time after every panel, which is three minutes time. And we are going to be um, opening up the floor for such uh, reflections. For more reflections, we will move into the breakout rooms and have an extended discussion there. Having said that, uh, I would love to first introduce um, our guest of honor today, uh, Mrs. Uh, Supriya Singh Chauhan, who is an advocate um, from uh, Jammu and she has been working exhaustively with the youth and with women as well. Um, and we would like to hand over the floor to her to open this event with a few words. Over to you, Supriya. Thank you so much. Asalaamu Alaikum. Namaste. Good evening. Satshrikal to everyone. Am I properly audible? Yes. Uh, before uh, coming to the topic, I would like to express my gratitude to the Jammu and Kashmir Policy Institute, especially to Javed Sahab and uh, to Ahmed Ali Fayaz. He's a friend. He recommended me to Javed Sahab and to Sohini Ji for giving me this opportunity to speak uh, on something, you know, which gives me goosebumps when I think about it. It's, some, it's not a topic, it's a feeling, it's an emotion personified. The, the very, the, when it comes to my mind that gender-based violence or violence in any form, it gives me a perception that, and it gives me an idea that it could happen to me also one day. When we talk of gender-based violence, it's not, you know, physical violence. This could be a physical violence. This could be a sexual violence. This could be a mental infliction of harm on your mental peace, on your body, on your soul, on your mind. So 
it has this this violence has many forms it is manifolded but when we talk about gender based violence nowadays the nowadays the concept is being changed and it is gradually changing i mean we are taking this violence you know the infliction of violence on men also but the stage has not come that we will totally you know talk about the gender based violence which includes men and women both till now or since time immemorial uh, the women the my women folks they are subjected to barbaric treatment they are subjected to cruelty in any form be it at their places be it at workplaces be in you know societal functions anywhere they are the live examples of cruelty of violences of any form but but the problem is that our the structure of our society is that she has been always you know looked down, down upon by that she cannot take her decisions that she cannot you know her decisions will be taken by other people uh, she is limited on resources she is limit she is i have done a little homework on this that then that she does not have proper control over her body also that somebody someone else has to take a decision for her someone else has to think that what she will wear how she will talk when she will go go you know go out from the home i mean when she is not married her parents has to take this call or her you know uh, brothers because we live in a maximum we live in a patriarchal society we can't think about that if i need to go out at 8 o'clock in the night i need to seek permission from my brother or my parents or my sister or my you know anybody till i get married the day i get married my custody i won't say it's my freedom it's my custody is handed over to my husband or with whom i am living you know after marriage so i don't have any control over my decisions not over my body so you know i want that see when we see the data if we see the national family health survey fourth we, we, i found that around 30% women they are being subjected to violence of any kind be physical sexual mental from the age to 15 to 49 and they have been subjected till they attained you know age of 15 all of them have been subjected to either once twice or three times and i was also reading about it that more than one in four women and in every three minutes they are subjected to violence so this is something this is something very of serious nature we have to think about it but no we don't have to you know just go for talks and things we have to work out on ground level we have to you know root it out from the uh, from the ground like we have everything available with us in if we if i am an advocate i see there are around 3500 plus pendency of domestic violence cases lying in my courts but who will take you know call on it and i have seen the urban poor women or the you know that middle class urban women they don't they don't want any help they don't even they don't perform even they don't inform that something is happening to them they are accepting it very you know happily or maybe there are some constraints that they don't want to come out because you know our society is that our our society is that we we want we want we we you know we either we blame that woman uh, that she has done yahi bahar gayi hogi isne kuch kiya hoga isliye isko aisa hua ya either we you know ostracize them ki hum unhe nikal denge we say or we do something for our honor so i want that hame agar kuch bhi kaam karna hai we have to perform at the ground level and we have everything on the platter all we need is to serve and we need to start awareing masses we need to start awareing these people we need to go to them and then only we can do something otherwise intellectuals or the forums or the places you know where we are working very with dedication and uh, determination we can't do anything except until unless they realize their rights they acknowledge their rights we need to reach up to them we need to tell them that see if this is happening to you you have to come out genuinely not like that in in order to satisfy vengeance you will say oh you to, you said me this i'll go against you in court i'll go to you know seek directions for um, uh, domestic violence i'll do this that should not be the case we should be very genuine and i know things would be would become better 
and yes one thing more i would like to add because i have less time to speak uh, otherwise it may take you know a day to speak on such a very important issue that we women we have been subjected to cruelty since time immemorial we should have an attitude that we don't want now our men to bear the same so we don't want that they should be subjected you know to such cruelties because since that has happened to us so with these words i would just like to say that we need to uh, aware our masses aware our girls aware our you know uh, females of every strata be they are from poor they are rich they are literate they are illiterate whatsoever they are of any religion of anything so please let's aware them and contribute to our society thank you so much thank you so much supriya ji um uh, we are really grateful that you've taken the time uh, to be here with us and to share your thoughts uh, and uh, we would love to have you on board for learning more about this um, in the future as well now we'll get to move on to our keynote speaker today uh that is miss geeta vaishnavi who is also uh, the founder uh, of winds of creativity which is an arts in education initiative and she is herself an artist a muralist and an educator and she's a strong proponent of how creativity belongs to all and should be explored by everyone so as a muralist she has worked on street art projects nationwide throughout the streets of india to her the world is her canvas She has painted on a plethora of themes ranging from women empowerment, child rights, conservation of natural resources, girl child education across the country. She has been part of many restoration projects from quaint little villages in the hills to bustling basties of New Delhi. So being a passionate Kashmiri, her paintings capture hope in loss, peace in conflict and beauty in Macabre. So we'd love to have um Geeta share with us a little bit of her experience and uh, also deliver the keynote address before we move on to our panelists over to you geeta very uh, good evening to everyone i'm having this bit of uh, issue with my uh, video i think the host has to uh, do something about it um can do you have your video turned on geeta yeah it's saying that uh, i cannot start the video because the host has stopped it okay i'll just try to see what yeah. is happening uh okay perfect good evening everyone thank you so much sohini for such a lovely introduction um i'm glad that winds of creativity has joined hands with the uh, jammu and kashmir policy institute for and uh, not only just our outreach partner for the current project that we are running to create awareness about the un women's uh, elimination of violence against women uh, project but also for various other projects that we would be initiating in the region a uh, little bit about winds of creativity it's an arts and education initiative where we try to provide quality arts and education to women and uh, children from underprivileged backgrounds and uh, we have been uh, working on a current project with the jammu and kashmir uh, institute which i would be uh, glad to share more with you but as we deal with the topic that we are talking about gender based violence and uh, i'm so glad about the riveting uh, you know facts which have been just uh, presented to us by supriya i just wanted to add uh, to that that these are figures that you know are are startling and uh, as she pointed out that all the forums that we convene or all, all the policy work that we try to do it should ripple down to the ground and for that we are not just having these uh, you know sessions that we are doing we are also having projects where we are trying to make uh people aware at the you know various uh, levels about uh, the various uh, you know options which are available to them if they are facing gender based violence and also making them aware about because uh, illiteracy illiteracy is a big problem in india and first step is to educate uh, women who are from undeserved uh, 
backgrounds about what it is that we are talking about when we talk about various forms of gender-based violence. As an artist, I wanted to share with all of you some of my artworks. And uh, if I could have the first slide of the artwork. I would request Jigyasa to uh, share the first artwork. Um, Jigyasa. Okay, so in the meantime, I can just uh, speak about, uh, I feel Kashmir for me is a sacred place, is a place from where I, uh, you know, my imagination gets ignited for my ideas, for my artwork. Uh, for the longest time, Kashmir, uh, you know, has inspired artists and poets like Lal Ded, Haba Khatun, and uh, very few would know that even Muhammad Iqbal and uh, Manto had their roots in Kashmir. But if you see the current state, there is dissolution and despair everywhere. Uh, through my art, I try to capture this. I try to capture the paradise which was once uh, described by Amir Khusro, and, as well as the current state of Kashmir. Uh, if I could have the slide for the first painting, which is called uh, Floating Markets and uh, Graves. Geeta, give me a minute to check. No there must be some problem at the technical end. I'll just ask Jagyasa what's happening. Uh, so Hinidi, you have disabled our screen share. You have to able it. Okay. So um, in this painting, this is uh, oil stretched on a six feet by five feet canvas, and uh, this. In this painting, I've tried to capture the uh, floating markets that happen in uh, Dal Lake every morning. Kashmir still thrives on its flower and vegetable markets. Uh, every day in the morning, uh, you can see uh, boats full of vegetables and flower vendors floating around on Dal Market. Daily life carries on amidst the chaos and the conflict uh, in the valley. Amir, a young little boy, used to play around these boats and his mother used to buy daily provisions. His tiny body lies lifeless, blood stained uh, in the boat and his mother cries in despair as she finds her lost son in one of these flower market floating boats. Uh, in this painting, I try to capture, uh, you know, how a child was shot because of a, a militants and a, you know, gun battle which ensued between the army and the militants and his, the grief of his mother uh, on losing out on her young son. Uh, if you could share the second slide. Okay, till the time the second slide is uh, shared, I'll just share what uh, the second painting is about. Uh, this is uh, called In Search for Gulnur. Uh, for those of us who are Kashmiris, we are born in families which are full of folklore, Kashmiri folklore, and we grow up listening to so many beautiful stories. Over here, I've tried to sh capture story of Gulnur. Gulnur is a mystical character, and it is said that, you know, when he would laugh, tulips will blossom all across the valley. In this artwork, I have shown how, uh, while Gul Noor is laughing, surrounded by beautiful tulips, there is a lady who is crying. Uh, there were, this lady was raped while she was pregnant, and her child, which was born, did not have an arm. In this painting, I've tried to capture her pain, her sadness, as well as I've tried to show even a mystical character like Gul Noor cannot bring happiness back to her life because of the pain and the violence that she has uh, suffered in her life. 
Now, through these two paintings, my aim was to sort of inspire all of you as you will be going into breakout sessions for your, uh, you know, various topics of discussion. I would also like to share a few artworks of the project that we uh, collaborated with Jammu and Kashmir Policy Institute for young women who are from underprivileged backgrounds. And like uh, Supriya pointed out, it is very important to not just have you know, these forums being initiated, but actually work at the grassroots level. And through our project, we actually try to create awareness amongst young little girls. So if artwork can be uh, shared so that I could explain more. These are artworks which are being created by young girls who are teenagers. Uh, first, I like to involve girls into like a you know, into a session in the workshop where we have fun and, you know, games. And then I try to inspire them to create artworks while we have a one on one dialogue where I try to, you know, make them aware about the various topics where they don't have much knowledge about. If I could uh, just show you the artworks. While we were conducting these uh, workshops, uh, COVID guidelines were also followed. And we try to make sure that, you know, we do not try to, you know, push uh, the girls and we try to give them with art supplies and materials. And then through WhatsApp and other uh, tech, we try to get, um, you know, the artworks that were created by these girls. They've also sent us videos, which you have been seeing on social media platforms. And if you haven't, I highly encourage you to watch them. Uh, the girls have really poured out their creativity. If Jigyasa could just share the artworks and we could uh, just see more of these wonderful creations by these young women. Uh, I'm really sorry, there is some technical error that no worries, no settings worries. with the host and the co host. So we have been unable to share the screens right now. Uh, we are trying to get it as soon as possible. Really, really sorry. In the meantime, I would really like to acknowledge the work that has been done by Jammu and Kashmir Policy Institute. I feel uh, it's just amazing that we have young leaders who are doing path breaking work and we need uh, such more uh, leadership in the area because if we need to bring change in the you know, current state of Kashmir, we need uh, work to be done at grassroots levels. And I would really like to acknowledge in the meantime, uh, we're trying to fix the tech, uh, the amazing work that is being done by the team of Jammu and Kashmir Policy Institute. Uh, we are we are struggling to get everything in place. I'm really sorry for the delay, for the inconvenience caused. Actually, because we are on Facebook Live, that's why it's getting a little confusing as well. <laughs> so we're just figuring that out. Um, Jukyasa, I've already made you co-host. Can you take a look, please? Okay, in the meantime, till we have the tech sorted out, I'll just explain you what was done uh, in the project. So basically, whenever I'm trying to conduct a creative intervention workshop, I always try to incorporate something fun uh, for, uh, you know, kids to enjoy while they're learning and not to make it a mundane, boring uh, session for them. Uh, so what I tried to do was uh, we created a little chits for kids and uh, we gave uh, we wrote various forms of gender-based violence against women for them. Uh, there were topics such as acid throwing, there were topics such as uh, girl-child marriage, uh, harassment at work, uh, verbal abuse, uh, and various other topics were also uh, incorporated in this workshop. What was, uh, what was interesting for me was that most of the women didn't even know about the various forms of violence they must be facing uh, that they weren't even aware of. Okay, so you can see the first artwork. This is uh, on Eve teasing. So uh, this was an amazing uh, little rendition by this little girl where she's trying to show that, you know, she is trying to go for a walk in the evening and uh, 
and you know how she is being stalked uh, while she's trying to do that with a friend and uh, clearly her signal is that she wants eve teasing to be stopped if i can have the second artwork Uh, I guess we. Uh, I guess that's all we can access for now. I'm really apologize for the inconvenience. No worries, no worries. Um, so while I was telling you about uh, the workshop, one of the girls uh, was, you know, constantly her father was a drunkard, and every day he would come back from work and really shout at uh, the girl as well as her mom. Uh, till till the time we did not have this workshop, the girl thought this was just normal behavior by him. It was only after we conducted the workshop and made her aware that you know just because the father has been in a way harassing the mother and the child does not mean that they have to go through this. There are ways that this issue should be addressed, and this is not good for their mental health as well. So this was one of the things that I wanted to mention how important it is to make these uh, children from underprivileged background aware about the various forms of violence they are uh, experiencing because most of them don't even know, uh, especially when it comes to, you know, what is a good touch, what is a bad touch. Most of these children also have some perverts in their families, you know, uh, who try to, you know, and this is being faced not only by women, what is interesting is even young men are being uh, sexually abused by their own family members. So these were some of very interesting, uh, you know, uh, insights that I uh, sort of uh, got aware about, you know, while I was conducting this workshop. And I couldn't agree more with Supriya that, you know, how much more work needs to be done, you know, at the grassroots and awareness campaigns, not just, you know, on social media, but actual work on the ground needs to be done. We're just trying to fix the tech a bit so that you guys could also see more artworks. Um, Okay, so uh, I think uh, there is a bit of an issue, but uh, what you can do is if, uh, you know, if you would like to see more of these amazing artworks created by young girls, you can visit a Jammu and Kashmir Policy Institute Facebook page, Instagram page, as well as Winds of Creativity Facebook and Instagram page. Uh, now I would like to, uh, you know, ask Sohini to sort of uh, get started with the uh, panel discussion which is lined up for the evening. Uh, thank you so much, Geeta, and I apologize once again for the inconvenience because of the tech issues. Technic there are technical issues at my end as well, like I'm barely being able to hear things. Um, I guess it's all a part of doing something like this for the first time. So um, thank you for your contribution. And yes, the campaign is something that is being run by Jammu and Kashmir Policy Institute and Winds of Creativity. So you can visit our pages to see more and we'll be uploading more of the beautiful artworks that Geeta has shared. Uh, now we'd like to move on to our first panelist uh, that is Mrinalini, Ms. Mrinalini Martin. Uh, she, is, uh, she hails from Kolkata, she's a social activist, an administrator, and educator. She has previously worked with reputed intergovernmental organizations and nonprofits. She's working with an anti-human trafficking organization at present and is a member of Reflections Research mm -hmm. Advocacy Group, which is a South and Southeast Asian women's advocacy group. She has an impressive track record of interpersonal skills and ex is an expert at managing risks and drawing solutions. To name a few, Ms. Manalini Martin has earlier volunteered at Avas, where she has worked for HIV-positive children. She has also volunteered at Indian Pluralism Foundation, 
as a youth coordinator for interfaith dialogues. Um, Ms. Martin is known to be a dedicated worker, a collaborator, and a team player, and aspires to grow each time and move up the ladder. So that's a little bit about Manalini. Uh, the rest, I'll leave it to her to share. Uh, her topic today on which she'll be sharing is COVID-19 and GBV, which is gender-based violence. She'll be throwing some light on the circumstances and the, the context of GD, GBV while we look at the COVID-19 crisis. Over to you, Mranalini. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shoini, for that introduction. Um, a very good evening to everyone, uh, all the participants, and warm greetings to my fellow panelists. Um, it is an honor and privilege to be able to share this platform with you guys and uh, discuss about the old and new pandemic we have been dealing with since ages now. So gender-based violence, or GBV, as we call it, is a global pandemic uh, that affects one in three women in their lifetime. Around 35% of women worldwide have experienced either physical and or sexual violence. 7% of women also have been sexually assaulted by someone other than a partner. And these numbers are not new at all. In fact, what is shocking is how COVID-19 has intensified these numbers. An investigation by Childline, the National Helpline for Children, set up by the Ministry for Women and Child Development, said that 1.92 lakh on-ground interventions were recorded between March and August of this year. Compared to 1.70 lakh interventions during the same period last year, and within these six months, Child Helpline received 27 lakh distress calls. And NCRB uh, National Crime Records Bureau data reported the number increased 11 times than what it was a decade ago. In a global compilation of reports of child sexual abuse material, CSAM, what we call it as child sexual uh, material online, you know, found online, and India stands on top of the list with 11.7% of the total reports. Also sometimes reported abuse cases fall dramatically and you would think um, the violence is going down. The drop is actually reflecting that women and vulnerable people are not able to report what's happening. You usually see this in time of crisis like now. We are dealing with a pandemic that has seen numbers intensifying at an alarming rate. Although both women and men experience violence because of their gender, the vast majority of violence is inflicted upon women, girls, and children. Gender-based violence not only is physical, but so much more emotional and has its adverse effects on mental health. The pandemic in the recent and the current scenario, what we've seen is repercussions at the ecological model community level to the extent that it decreases social cohesion and ac access to public services um, and the institutions comprising individuals, social support networks. Uh, the search for help, protection, and alternatives are jeopardized by the suspension or reduction of activities in religious centers, daycare centers, schools, uh, school protection services, as well as by shifting our priorities in health services to actions targeted to see the patients for COVID-19. Um, you know, the sus suspected and the confirmed cases that we saw during COVID-19. All these factors contribute to the persistence and aggravation of pre-existing situations of violence. And why do you think this happens? And especially during, this is an age old disease we've seen. Every time we've come across this issue of gender-based violence. But do, don't you think it's intensified? It's at an alarming rate, especially during the pandemic, especially since the isolation, since we've uh, gone uh, under lockdown. And at, at the relational level, longer time in contact with the, you know, why these would happen. Um, I would point out a few things here. Uh, in contact with the aggressor is a central factor especially during COVID-19, what we're talking about. People are confined in their homes 
And in addition to due to the reduction reduction in the victim's social contact with friends and family, um, you know, the possibilities are reduced for women to create or strengthen a social support, network, seek help, and escape the situation of violence. Daily around the clock, the contact, especially in low-income families, what we see living in housing with few rooms and overcrowding reduce the possibilities for filing complaints, like I mentioned earlier, uh, thus discouraging women from making this decision to file complaints against the violence they've been going through. And the following individual factors can lead to aggravation of the violence. The aggressors increase stress due to fear of falling ill, uncertainty about the future, impossibility of social contact. Um, the imminent threat of reduced income, especially in the underprivileged classes, where a large proportion make their living from, from informal labor. Most of us um, have seen migrant workers and laborers you know, suffering during these days and this time of COVID. And the consumption of alcoholic beverages and other psychoactive substances. Overload on the women with housework and care for the children, elderly and the sick family members can also reduce her ability to avoid conflict with the aggressor, in addition to leaving her more vulnerable to psychological violence and sexual coercion. Fear of violence also affects uh, her children, uh, you know, confined to the house, another paralyzing factor that hinders the search for help. There is no help. There's nothing that she could reach out to. Um, finally, finally, financial dependence on the house husband due to the economic stagnation and the impossibility of informal work. So effectively to combat or, you know, prevent mm -hmm. gender-based violence or what we call GBV, we need to understand the complex forces that drive it. This is not a single story uh, of a drunk man abusing his wife or his girlfriend, but each victim is marginalized in a unique way. And we must understand that. This means we need not only analyze the triggers of uh, gender-based violence, but also identify the factors that make certain groups more vulnerable while exposing how these factors intersect and reinforce one another. Um, I would like to emphasize on the fact that while um, we are having dialogues and seminars and protests, we also need to reach to the grassroots. A grassroots movement is very much needed. Uh, this itself should be an incentive for policymakers to take this issue seriously. To all the participants um, present here today, we heard our, our guest speaker earlier speaking about how it is important to address this issue. We've had a lot of dialogues and discussions, but what we must do is now put it into action. We need to see it into action. We need to see lives changing. And so I urge you all to take this knowledge and information to the areas where education is limited, where access to, um, you know, uh, to mobile phones or to information is limited. We need to empathize with people facing discrimination and injustice, especially during this isolated period. You might have people around you or just next to you. There might be a person just next to you who's facing discrimination and violence, uh, but is unable to speak up. So to talk about gender-based violence, we need to make sure women and girls know what it means, what the laws say, how one can stand against it, the irony is um, that gender-based violence is a violation of human rights, um, you know, stripping someone of their basic human right. And yet, uh, gender-based violence is not acknowledged as an issue. It is only recently that we speak about it and we, um, you know, have movements, uh, we have protests and we um, have dialogues as fees uh, to address this and to talk about it and to see how we can come up with new policies uh, to change this narrative of, uh, you know, uh, women and girls because they're vulnerable, because they're a weaker section of society. Why, why can't we change that narrative? The common thing here is this issue goes across the spectrum of all demographics. This is not in a country or in a particular community. It is all throughout. It is globally, it's a global issue. 
women worldwide face violence from their partners, their employees, colleagues, um, and most of the time by their own family members. Yes, it is hard to believe that sometimes family is behind that violence. Um, the outbreak, especially this COVID-19, has exasperated already gaping inequalities for women and girls across the globe. And in every conceivable sphere, from health and the economy to security and social protection. Domestic violence in particular, according to one eloquent uh, observer, is acting like an opportunistic infection flourishing in the conditions created by the pandemic. So why not address it and help women next to you, girls around you, stand up against violence? This is not a women's issue. This is a community's issue. The toxic masculinity concept should be rephrased. And don't, don't take me wrong, men are not naturally violent. They are not naturally violent. They are made, you know, the environments are uh, affected, uh, you know, the family conditions, the upbringing um, is affected and that's why they become so. So there is a need to invite men in forums as these to help them take initiatives to educate other men and boys. Um, I see that our panelists today are all women and I'm proud of it. I'm really proud of that, that everyone uh, is representing, we are all women here, uh, which I'm proud of, but uh, we want men to come up front and take this uh, position as a panelist to speak and address this issue. So like I earlier said, and I shared the statistics of how one in every uh, three woman, uh, women are affected by violence. So don't you think that that also means that two in three good, uh, three men are good and they, that they respect women and that they stand against, uh, you know, stand against this uh, uh, crime of uh, gender-based violence. So two in those three men are good men, are responsible men. And we must help them realize that so that they can come forward and um, you know, talk about this issue. Um, take this to the areas where uh, you know, men need to be educated. Therefore, we must help our male friends uh, to take steps to combat this disease. I call it a disease um, you know, because we are still looking for a vaccine. We haven't yet found a vaccine for this disease that is gender-based violence or violence against women and girls. We still haven't found a vaccine. So, uh, you know, it is so important that we uh, talk about this and not only talk, but put it into action. So words are powerful. I believe words are powerful and they can transform lives. Um, so together, let us um, redouble our efforts to end gender-based violence, um, not only during COVID-19, but beyond. Um, I wouldn't take much of your time um, I've given a lot of statistics already, but um, yes, this is an important topic and uh, we must, we must address it. Thank you. Over to Shohini. Thank you so much, Manalini. Those were some really good statistics and definitely some very good points. Uh, we would now open the floor for a period of two minutes. I'm sorry we are bringing it down from three to two minutes because we are going to take it on in the uh, breakout rooms. Uh, so for two minutes, if you have anything to say, anything to add, anything to contribute, please raise your hand and we will uh, unmute you so that you can contribute to the discussion. All right, I see Orkumitra has raised her hand. So Orkumitra, please go ahead. Hi, Manalini. Thank you so much. It was a fascinating talk that you shared with us, and I can only agree with everything that you pointed out. And so I wanted to raise the issue of, you know, you, you raised a very pertinent point that all women here, all panelists are women. And I would also like to see more men out here and also the LGBTQ angle. So we, when we talk of women, you know, this is gender-based violence we are addressing. And 
Uh, as somebody who is aware of how LGBTQ groups and what's going on in the communities, I know violence has gone up in this pandemic time for them as well. But as long as we do not include representatives from them into these discussions as well, it's like we are normalizing that they'll always be a separate community. So if we, we, if we have to have a holistic dialogue, we need to be a more diverse group. And also, I think gender-based violence also includes men, as, as our guest speakers pointed out. And I remember a discussion in our school, in our university days, where uh, a professor of mine, she's, uh, she's, she had been working on how men are raped often and they can't talk about it. So there's a double level of silence because men tend to lose their masculinity if they are raped and they talk about it. So we need to open it up and say, as you said, it's not a women's issue. It's an issue for a community. Rape is not gender specific, although women, are, women suffer more. But it, we need to make the de -gen, sort of desexualize the connotations of these and treat them as violence and the trauma it entails, I think. Would love to hear other responses on this. Thank you so much, Orkomitra. I see that Shivangi has raised her hand. Uh, so those are some very pertinent points indeed, uh, Orkomitra. Indeed, gender-based violence should encompass the entire spectrum uh, of uh, gender-based violence, uh, but uh, due to obviously uh, lack of capacity to engage at, at that uh, big a level, but we hope that we'll get there someday. So, um, Shivangi, um, yeah, I over to you. To say. Yeah, okay. So, I I understand people's emotions when it comes to I these panelists when they say that, oh, why are all women here? But I just have one thing to say at the outset. Men have had spaces to talk for all these centuries, right? And they have, they have really captured spaces. So I guess it's really important for women who've been silenced for centuries to come out and talk. I do agree that there could be, for example, people from various social locations, like for LGBTQIA community to be represented here. But I do not believe like that you, we still need to always harp on the point that, oh, why are men not here? Because we have manuals for that matter. So I think I was just feeling that emotion <laughs> to come and I'm so sorry, Zoini. All right, thank you. Absolutely, Shivangi. Um, and we do have men here. In fact, uh, one of the biggest um, uh, signs of the fact that we do have men who are a very big part of this space and this forum is that the organization which uh, I represent and the organization which is organizing this, it has a lot of men who are uh, supporting this initiative and without their support and without uh, their um, you know, uh, without them, we can, could not have imagined uh, this entire forum. So um, we would love to acknowledge uh, Javit Rali, Tosif Rayana, JP Singh, and our entire team and all the other men, our colleagues, who are also like who are working overtime and, you know, providing so much of support to this initiative. Uh, so yes, it's the space is where women speak, but the space that is provided has as its pillars, both men and women. So um, I assure you, we have not forgotten the, forgotten the men. So uh, moving on to the next um, panelist, we have uh, Sub Khalid from Pakistan. She will be speaking um, to us on domestic violence. I now, guess. a little a bit about um, Sub would be that she is someone who is a motivational speaker and for good reason. She is somebody who has uh, gone through a lot. I wouldn't want to give away her whole story, but without giving a little bit of the background, um, it wouldn't be fair <laughs> to introduce her. So uh, please bear with me. Uh, Shub's biggest um, growth phase was her own, um, you know, her own experience of rising out of practically nothing 
with no degree or finance at hand and she had an ailing child to support. She's a single parent who has faced quite some harsh realities in her society. Uh, she was abandoned with her ailing child uh, just at an age where girls are in the process of stitching fantasies and fairy tales under the fabric of their dreams. Mm -hmm. And she saw it all burning into ashes like a nightmare. Persistent efforts and hard work led her to in no time attain the first step towards achieving what she had imagined for herself. Today, she supports women who go through uh, difficult uh, domestic issues and um, domestic issues to uh, stand and help. I think there is somebody who's unmuted. I would request everyone to mute their mic. Please mute yourself. I have muted. All right. So sorry for the interruption. So uh, when it comes to Sub, she's somebody who stands as an example of everything that we're talking about, somebody who has braved it all and who stands today to motivate and inspire other women. So without giving away anything more, we welcome Sub Khalid from Pakistan. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much, Soini. That was a very humbling uh, um, intro. I'm literally speechless. <laughs> thank you so much. I just hope I deserve all that you said that. Um, thank you. Well, Soini has summed it up for me. I am actually an example of what, you know, I mean, the gender-based violence and how I kind of uh, faced it and how I addressed it in my own capacity and how I ask women to do it who reach out to me for help. Um, this is how I like doing it. I like, um, I like keeping myself easily accessible for women in my community and across the country too, uh, through my blog, through my Facebook profile, which is public for everyone, for anyone who wants to talk, not, not just girls, guys too. Because, um, and another thing about gender violence I'd like to you know, uh, bring your attention to is that gender violence, if I talk about myself, I'm a woman, I face gender violence, it wasn't necessarily coming from the opposite gender. You know, It wasn't coming from the guys. It was coming from the females too. It was coming from the parents, it was coming from the in-laws, it was coming from you know, all the people all around me. I was vulnerable to everyone. And, and now when I realize it, um, somewhere without realizing it consciously as a woman as a young girl I was allowing it to happen to myself and that is what we need to understand when we're going to when we're going to talk about finishing this problem from the root cause you have to let them know that this is the problem they have they're allowing it to themselves they need to stand up they need to identify this is this is this is wrong they're allowing it to themselves they have to stand up with themselves and say no to it first because you know, if somebody comes to me and tells me, okay, um, help me address my, um, I am being a victim of gender violence. You know what, first thing I'm gonna tell them, are you ready? Are you willing to take the step and stand against it and identify it something wrong and you don't wanna allow it to yourself? Are you ready to not to allow it to yourself? Because that is the first step towards it. And this is what I tell, uh, tell my friends, all the women, all the guys who reach out to me and they ask me how I did it. Um, I'm still a single parent. I am still living on my own. I'm still, um, you know, facing all the challenges and I'm loving it because um, I think I know how to cope with it. And that is by identifying what is right and wrong. There's a very thin line between, because, you know, us women, we're, we're very emotional beings. There are times when we fall into emotional trap and we can't identify if it's, if it's an emotional abuse, like gender violence can be in form of anything, right? Um, it can be emotional, it can be physical, it can be mental. At times we allow it to happen, we fall into denial because we don't wanna ruin things up for ourselves, but no, that is wrong. We first need to know that this is wrong and we need to stop and we need to you know, not allow it to happen to us. And that is the first step towards it and that is how I do it. And um, Again, this is what I've done with myself too. And it was all experimental. I did not have anyone around me to tell me, okay, this is how I have to go about it, but I did it on my own. Um, you know, the, the part where I realized, uh, uh, where I found myself being able to explore my full potential was when I was independent of anyone when I was not waiting out for anyone to come and save me, when I knew that I was going to be my own savior, when I knew that I'm not waiting for anyone to come and help me, 
that is when I realized this is the time, this is the state where I can achieve my full potential, where I can explore myself, where I can know how do I counter the, you know, the all, all kinds of abuse that were thrown, you know, against me and I would take it and I need to stop doing that. So, um, because I'm not a celebrity, um, I'm just a, you know, motivational speaker and I have a blog. And the reason why I have these two things is because I just want to be a, accessible to women in my community who probably find it hard to follow a celebrity or somebody who's already, you know, achieved that fame. And it's hard for them to follow because they're now idle, you know. So I thought maybe I'd remain a common person who, you know, they find easy to follow, they find believable, they find, you know, uh, easy to accept. So uh, this has been really helpful. So I think that is a sense of achievement, that gives me a sense of achievement for my capacity to, to be able to be available for women and men in my community who still do reach out to me. And we often have one-on-one -on -one sessions where they want to talk about how I did it. And that is how they find their hope, or maybe they find the, that guideline they need of how I did it. So um, that is how I think I'm doing my part in my society. And uh, without waiting for any forums or without waiting to be invited somewhere to speak I'm just available any at any point in time in any because you know what we, all of us women here right now uh, we're probably here for a reason we were born as healers we were born as impact and not everyone is born like that so you know we're here for a purpose all of us right now probably we have this one common purpose to be available to people out there to be easily accessible to them Give them that hint, give them that expression, this expression that, you know what, you, you're you there for them. You, you know, you're, you, you, they can come and talk to you if they need help. So that is the attitude I've um, put up with people around me. And uh, that has in no way harmed me. I have no regrets till date. I've been doing this for four years now. I probably, I love it when somebody tells me, you know, so I finally found that way or the strategy or or, you know, I finally realized that I need to move on. I need to finally realize how to stop, you know, myself from being a victim. It, it, it gives me this immense sense of achievement where I feel like, okay, the, the, the purpose, the universal, universal purpose I was uh, sent with is, is I'm working on it. I'm not stagnant there. I'm moving on with it. So this is what I'm going to tell all of you. It's not difficult. We don't have to wait for, for, for a law to be passed on it. Just be available, reach out to people in your community, have a little setup, informal setup at your homes every week. You know, maybe have um, coffee sessions around the cafes and you're just float out the word that there's going to be, you know, a get together, talk about it. And, and trust me, this works wonders. That is going to have a snowball effect, dominoes effect. People are going to know about it. They're going to know that there's somebody who wants to talk about, who wants to offer help. And all they need to know is they need to find it in themselves to say no. As long as they're not willing to say no to it themselves, you can do nothing to help them. Build boards around them, you won't be able to help them. You just have to make them realize that they have to stand up and say no first. It's as easy as that. Thank you, Thank, you. Thank you so much, So Thank you for being so, so happily um, available to share your story with us and to uh, come here and inspire us um, as you endlessly inspire, of course. Uh, so for more of Shubh's story, you can visit um, www.womenspace.online where I've covered this uh, wonderful woman's story, a story which has shaken me up, definitely, personally. And I'm sure you all will find much inspiration from it. Um, we will uh, keep a two minutes um, um reflection time so if anybody would like to speak or share anything please uh raise your hand and we'll hand over the floor to you but please keep two minutes to two minutes we will have further discussions in the breakout rooms no worries okay so Looks like everyone is a little awestruck with the story already. So we'll, if there are any prompts or any questions or any aspects of this topic of domestic violence that uh, you would want to take up 
at a later stage in the breakout rooms. Um, kindly uh, put them in the chat box. So we are also curating questions and prompts from the chat box. We will take them up in the breakout room. I think there is somebody who's unmuted. Um, if I will mute. What is domestic pollution? Domestic animals pollution, wow. Okay. Um, so everybody is muted. All right. So now we will move on to our next panelist, who is um, a very experienced facilitator from Indonesia. Uh, please welcome Mrs. Vivin Romavati. She's the Vice Director of Institute of Southeast Asian Islam and a board member of the Forum for Interreligious Harmony in Yogyakarta. She's been working in the field of interreligious dialogue for over 15 years. In 2015, a part of her initiative of the Kaiseed International Fellows Program. Uh, she founded the interreligious um, women's community called Srikandi Lintas Iman. I hope I have pronounced it correctly. In case I haven't, please forgive me. Um, in 2018, she was accepted as one of the awardees of the Australia Awards in Indonesia, Short-Term Awards on Multi-Faith Women Leadership Program. The project awards entitled Intra-Muslim Dialogue among women in Yogyakarta has been implemented at the end of 2018. So please welcome Mrs. Vivin Romavati. Vivin, over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Sahini. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, good night, everyone. I would like to thank you very much for Sahini and also Jekta uh, 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 Institute for inviting me to be part of this uh, very interesting uh, event. Uh, but I'm sorry, my English maybe is not as good as you all. <laughs> English is my second language, <laughs> but I will try my best. Okay, um, uh, I would like to start with the data. Um, I think uh, Ms. Marina Lini already mentioned a little bit about how actually uh, in global situation, the women uh, are uh, the most, uh, let's say, the most uh, victim of the gender-based uh, violence, even though uh, male or men also uh, become the victim of these uh, issues. Uh, I would add uh, the data in Indonesia, actually. Uh, yeah, um, according to the National Commission on Violence Against Women, or we call Komnas uh, Perempuan, in its annual notes on violence against women uh, in March 7, 2020, uh, showed that uh, there are 431,000 for uh, 471 cases in 2019. So this number actually increased uh, compared to the previous year, uh, which amounted to 406,178 uh, cases. Uh, Komnas Perempuan uh, sort out the locus of violence uh, into three, the personal sphere, uh, which is domestic violence or personal relations, the community sphere and the sphere of the state. Uh, but uh, the highest percent percentage of cases are violence against wives or marital violence. This uh, shows uh, unequal gender uh, relation between husband and wife, uh, which put the wife in coordinate position in the institution of marriage. And uh, basically, uh, in Indonesia, we have uh, law number 23 uh, to 2004 concerning the elimination of domestic violence. Uh, but still, uh, the case, uh, you know, even uh, uh, increase every year. Uh, another data uh, that is within 12 uh, years, uh, violence against women in Indonesia has increased by 792%. Uh, so it's almost... 800% you can imagine. So it means that violence against women in my country is actually uh, uh, very high. And, uh, and this data is actually still an iceberg phenomenon, uh, which can be interpreted that, uh, in fact, the condition in, uh, in, uh, of Indonesian women is actually far from safe. Uh, 
uh, that just for information. Uh, now I would like to start with how actually uh, religion related to gender-based uh, violence. Uh, there are several uh, factors that cause gender-based violence, uh, yeah, such as you. gender uh, role and power imbalances. Yeah, women as a second class or lower status or inferior to men, and cultural and traditional beliefs, uh, weak policies, and also uh, a week of legal protection. But among those uh, factors, the religious beliefs is actually uh, one very important, or maybe. Uh, uh, not uh, the most, but very, very important factor that is uh, quite influential in religious communities such as in Indonesia, in my country. As you are aware uh, that the majority of Indonesian people are Muslim. Yeah, they are strongly uh, adhered to their religious beliefs in worship and in congregational activities. Uh, that is why religious interpretation of the Quran and Hadith actually greatly influence uh, our behavior. Uh, the gender bias religious interpretation uh, then will make women more disadvantaged in their uh, daily relationship. Uh, but uh, maybe also uh, some of you also know that actually Islam uh, intended uh, is intended to build new uh, social foundation that are egalitarian and anti-discrimination and anti-violence against women compared to uh, to the what we call to the background and the or the situation or the context uh, at the time uh, when uh, Muhammad uh, uh, got revelation from from God um, and this actually uh, social foundation has been demonstrated by our prophet and his wife Muhammad and Khadija where they built household uh, their household based on mutual respect share responsibility uh, justice and uh, also mutual support and love um, and uh, uh, when we talk about uh, um, what we call uh, the detail of what the, the law or the, the Islamic law uh, Islam is actually uh, has discussed in detail women's rights both in the Quran and in the Islamic law including marriage divorce uh, property inheritance custody of children uh, evidence reward and punishment um, I got my my bachelor degree actually in Islamic law, so uh, I learned a lot about this uh, this uh, what they call these issues. Now, but when we examine more deeply, actually there is no single text either in the Quran and Hadith that provides an opportunity uh, to treat women uh, arbitrarily. Arbitrarily, yeah. Uh, but however. The text of, of Islam, uh, like most in Christian uh, and Judaism as, as Abrahamic uh, religion, actually have been interpreted in a ways uh, that support patriarchal social relation. If we see, there are a number of verses of the Quran and Hadith that can be considered as the basis of legitimacy uh, to demean women and place them in the subordinate position uh, over men. Uh, this can provide opportunities for men, for men, uh, for female, uh, for men to do violence against women in the name of religion. Uh, yeah, there are actually uh, Islamic uh, laws or teachings commonly used to justify uh, violence against women, including the prohibition of leaving the house unless there is an urgent need. Uh, this is stated in the Quran, Surat Al Ahzab, uh, verses 33. Uh, by some people, this verse actually understood as God's uh, provision which ob obliged women to live in the house or uh, just stay, uh, just do uh, in the domestic uh, sphere. And another example is actually uh, one hadith say that uh, all the good deeds of women are considered to have fallen before God just because she was led in serving her husband's sexual needs. And it is narrated in the hadith that uh, but again, uh, basically, these uh, two hadith uh, considered as hadith maudu or invalid. Uh, but still, some people use this text to justify the absolute obligation of women to obey uh, their husbands. And, but the, and the most explicit, ex explicit statement of the Quran regarding the superiority of men over women is found in the Quran Surat An-Nisa. Uh, 
uh, verses 34, yeah, saying uh, that men are the caretakers of women, as men have been provisioned uh, by Allah over women and us with supporting them financially. And righteous women are devoutly obedient and when alone, protective of what Allah has entrusted them with. And if you sense ill conduct from your women, advise them first. If they persist, do not share their debts. But if they still persist, then discipline them gently. But if they change their ways, do not uh, be unjust to them. Surely Allah is most high, all great. That's uh, the, the meaning of the, the Quran, Surat An-Nisa, verses 34. So this uh, verse explicitly shows the legality of husband uh, committing act of violence in the form of beating his wife who commit a uh, nushus, we call nushus. So this male, uh, the male superiority is also shown actually in the Quran, Surat Al-Baqarah, uh, verses 228. Uh, uh, so on the basis of these verses, almost all, of, almost all interpreters agree on male superiority. This is actually the problem. But uh, as we are aware also that uh, uh, it's, uh, I think um, uh, in the last three decades, uh, Islamic feminism also grown. Uh, who uh, see patriarchy is as, uh, the origin of all my misogynist tendency. Yeah, misogynist is the, uh, the, the hatred of women, yeah, uh, especially when, when interpret uh, the text. Uh, so this is uh, actually, uh, for example, yeah, for example, Muslim feminists uh, like Fatima Mernisi, I think you are uh, know uh, her. Ripat Hasan or Nawal El Sadawi, Amina Wadud, Wadud Muhsin, she is now in Indonesia actually, and uh, the late Asghar Ali engineer, uh, India, yeah, I know I know him very well, He's, I met him uh, several times, and uh, also other uh, Muslim feminists uh, trying to dismantle various normative knowledge that is biased uh, toward men's interest in the orientation of religious life especially related to gender relation. But in Indonesia also, we have Muslim feminist figure such as Nasaruddin Umar. Uh, now he's the, the imam of, uh, of the masjid uh, Mosque al Istiqlal in Jakarta. Uh, this is like a national mosque. Yeah? So this is the largest mosque in actually uh, in the past, the largest mosque in Southeast Asia. Uh, and also there is uh, Budi Munawar Rahman and Hussein Muhammad and others. Uh, in short, actually, as uh, is uh, written in uh, the poster that if we talk about religion, actually, uh, regarding the gender uh, violence issues, religion can be used as uh, resources, yeah, as a positive uh, way uh, for those who experience uh, abuse and violence uh, for, to find a safety and, you know, the, a process of healing, but also uh, religion can be misused to do uh, to uh, people to do violence, excuse and condone abusive beh behavior. Uh, and I think uh, the most important thing now is actually what should uh, what can uh, we do or what should be done uh, to uh, to decrease the gender based uh, violence, uh, especially uh, in the in the religious community. Uh, Faith-based community, in particular religious leaders, uh, actually uh, are uh, yeah, a, a key catalyst for positive social change. Religious leaders in this uh, case is a very important stakeholder in responding to gender-based violence issue and play an influential role in validating and promoting best practices for preventing and reducing uh, gender-based violence. Uh, the second one is the issue of gender-based uh, violence actually leads to methodological problems in the interpretation of religious texts and also the stagnation of Muslims to, to critically analyze these texts in a changing atmosphere and history. And the last one, uh, the faith-based organization need to participate in encouraging discussion and enactment of the elimination of sexual violence regulations uh, and to be part of the prevention and handling violence against women. Uh, I think that's all what I can say. Thank you very much uh, for your attention. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you so much, Vivin. Uh, you really did send us, um, like you really did give us a lot of information. 
and sent us to this entire world of trying to understand comparatively how religion has influenced culture across centuries and how it's still misused to this day. Um, and that is a very important aspect that no one really talks about. So we are really grateful for all the information you shared uh, in the context of your country and your religion. Uh, we would now uh, like to open up the floor for two minutes to um, anyone who would wish to um, add something to it, or if you have anything at all that you want to share, uh, please raise your hand and we'll go straight to you. So, Hini, uh, meanwhile, can you again mute everyone? I'm seeing some of the members have unmuted themselves. Oh, hang on. Yeah. Just a second. Uh... As far as I see, people are muted now. Kindly keep yourself muted when you are, when somebody is sharing. If you have anything to say, please raise your hand and we'll give the floor to you. If we do not have any more reflections to offer for uh, this part and you'd like some time to think, then we can move on to the next panelist and then we'll discuss this topic in one of our breakout rooms. So um, moving on to the next panelist. So our next panelist is uh, Ms. Shivangi Deshwal. She is a gender-based violence prevention specialist and she's a feminist social worker from the Tata Institute of Social Sciences, Mumbai. She worked as a team lead of the Little Sister Program at Sneha, a women-centered technology-based crisis intervention app that captures real-time violence in informal uh, urban settlements of Dharavi and Govandi, Mumbai, and provides immediate psychosocial and legal support to survivors of violence. Please, um, I request again to those who have unmuted themselves to please mute yourself. Going back to our panelist, uh, Shivangi earlier worked as research assistant at Tata Institute of Social Sciences on the National Evaluation Study of Family Counseling Center, Ministry of Women and Child Development, Government of India. Prior to which she worked as a project officer, resource center for interventions on violence against women. We welcome Shivangi, who will be sharing with us today on online abuse and gender-based violence, something that is a very pertinent topic given, uh, as we know, how the online space is becoming the next great, the next big thing as we transition into a new knowledge economy. Over to you, Shivangi. All right, so hi, everyone. Uh, I'll request for Jagyasa to go on to the next slide. I'm just going to like quickly get into this so that we don't waste time. Okay, so uh, just do this like a full screen view on top. Like, I don't know, from here. Fit one full page of us, a full screen. Okay, l let it be, let it be. It's fine, calm down. <laughs> okay, fine. So why are we here? What are we going to learn from this session? So I thought I'll just like make it clear for everyone. So firstly, we're going to know what is online abuse. So what entails online abuse? How is the online abuse gendered? What is technology facilitated gender-based violence? Second, we are going to know who is at a higher risk of being abused online. So we're going to talk a little bit about intersectionality matrix, the social location of the person or the individual. Third, we're gonna know how can you protect yourself? So we're gonna talk a little bit about online safety and what to do in case you're being abused. Last but not the least, we are gonna talk about women control and internet. All right, so next slide, great. Just, I mean, can you do it full screen? Cause I can't see it. I mean, maybe go on view, go on top on view next to edit. Yeah, and then just press uh, full screen mode, control plus L. Great, okay. So online abuse 
people get really confused but online abuse is the continuation of the misogyny that women face in the offline world so you're already facing that kind of violence in a patriarchy that we all exist in and online abuse becomes an extension to this so online becomes a tool with which you perpetuate gender based violence what does it include it could include stalking hate speech bullying sexual harassment trolling unsolicited pornography unwanted sexualization so now here is the thing people often get confused as to who's the perpetrator so here's a difference there could be a personal person that you know personally in a intimate partner relationship or for example an ex partner or an acquaintance or it could be stranger on the internet what is the kind of violence that can happen with uh, a person like the person or the stranger so for example in the personal it becomes an extension to the intimate partner violence or domestic violence so you could be in a relationship the person's uh you know is stalking you and by stalking i mean like why you online on whatsapp who are you talking to why have you like that photo etc etc and like really using coercive control to kind of get you into what they feel is the idea of the correct girlfriend or the correct woman right so that is intimate partner stalking or revenge porn so what is revenge porn just for people who might not know you could be in a relationship you could be in a consensual space where you're uh, sexting with the person or for example you are uh sending intimate photos or videos and then you have a breakup or you have a fight and then after that the person blackmails you or threatens you and says that listen i'm going to show this photo of yours to your natal family i'm going to show it to your friends and you are going to be this person who people are going to be like oh no like this is what just happened she's had sex with that person right so in a way uh it's a it's called revenge porn okay so now with stranger it could happen trolling which is very common on twitter unsolicited pornography maybe someone's followed you on instagram or any of the social media and you get like a picture of their reproductive organ or a penis which you did not ask for and then it's in your face so that is a form of gender based violence it could be bullying or hate speech next slide okay so this is from the icrw that i've picked up from i've just added the higher risk category so just to get an idea for every one of us like why does the perpetrator do it what is the motivation what is the intent and again like what happens what is the impact on the victim or the survivor so now if you go from left you look at the perpetrator what is the motivation it could be revenge like i said in revenge porn it could just be plain jealousy it could be some political agenda so with women in politics when you do not follow the ideology that they are practicing or the majority practice so then that becomes an issue anger it could be some form of sexual desire or it could be a monetary need that the person needs some form of money from you and extortion so they do that by sending a photos etc intent now the intent of the perpetrator here is to have some form of psychological harm physical harm or some norm enforcement now what is norm enforcement that this is the social order of the whatever country you're in and this is what patriarchy tells you that this is how the woman needs to be this is how the religion and the society etc tells you that this is the ideal woman all right so this is a way of getting you back into that norm and forcing you to say this is your place and this is how you're supposed to be now what are the behaviors that i've explained before it could be stalking defamation like defaming a person bullying sexual harass harassment exploitation or hate speech again the relationship could be personal impersonal or institutional now here the impact now the impact could be physical again like you could actually have someone stalk you from online abuse later follow you and actually physically hurt you right which is which is a very high tendency psychological because you have anxiety or depression the the fact that people are following you like or, or, or just sending some text that is unwanted and you do not want uh, social people get to know around you and there's some form of ostracization from the family or people who you know economic again you could lose a job because someone's posted something about you or some personal information that could really lose your job right so functional functional could be that uh someone saying oh i saw you going to the tuition or i saw you uh, you were standing with your father in xyz place so you tend to really fear that kind of uh, what do you say this kind of message so you change your route so rather than going from point a to point b and you know that the stalker the person now knows that this is the point that you're going you change your route so that becomes a functional issue and an impact now on help seeking that means what happens when you're wanting to go and seek help or cope with it so more than to know that you could do reporting of it now before reporting i think for everyone and whoever is attending this uh, seminar or panel discussion uh, we need to be very sure that we do documentation now what is documentation you have to document every kind of abuse that we go through now i'm just going to explain to you quickly what is the whatsapp documentation that's needed or on a facebook or a whatsapp on a whatsapp if someone sends you a message that is clearly abusive and has some form of sexual 
undertone or some form of you know abusive uh, violent thing that someone's written you're supposed to take a screenshot of it now just don't take the screenshot of the message it's important for you to take a screenshot of who sent you the message for example okay this is person a and this is their number so you have two screenshots there so what you're doing in the process is you might not want to go for legal services or go involve the legal uh, you know enforcement here but you're actually creating some form of documentation for yourself that you're trying to protect yourself right and in there you could also uh, on facebook for example or anywhere where you are on a dating site which is online etc you have to take the screenshot where you see the url so we are we, we know that this is the url that it's easy for the person to track or whoever you complain to right and another thing if you are on social networking sites and someone you always have the option of report abusing you could block the person right so keeping yourself safe or you could you know not share your password here uh, you could go for support services that could be the legal support service i know in india i do not know anywhere else so uh, you could have social workers in india i know there is special cell that works uh, which is a field action project of tata institute of social sciences that work, works across india which has social workers plays in police system so they could you know really handhold you across the process to get you some form of justice uh, you could have social support you could tell people around you i know it couldn't be an issue because women fear that their mobility will be restricted if they tell their natal family or their family that you know this is the kind of violence that i'm facing but uh, you could try with people who are supportive you could use the changing technology like changing technological use for some time you could get off that social media you could take some time off and really cope with what has just happened or you could you know just avoid the situation there in behaviors if you see below it could be frequency so frequency means that it's not necessary for someone to just you know abuse you once it could continuously be abusive it could be in some certain time frame it could be a lot of behaviors like we seen before and a lot of more so it could just be on the phone on the email physically being behind you or like really like doxing you etc now the mode of it already explained on the cross cutting tactics uh, tactics so okay what is doxing if people do not know it's search and publishing private or identifying information about a particular individual on the internet and there's always a malicious intent in order to do that that is doxing you could be hacking the person or you could be threatening image based abusing gender trolling using fake accounts now why do i say that some people are at higher risk category so on the intersectionality matrix for people who do not know what intersectionality is it is a concept which says that we have to acknowledge that everyone has unique experience of discrimination and oppression so from the social location you could look at your gender your caste your race um, sexual orientation and that some people are more um, like have a higher risk of victimization and therefore they're going to face that level of abuse or more abuse on the internet for example in the uk when women in politics were entering and i've forgotten the name but there was a woman uh, in the black community and she complained that this is the kind of abuse that felt uh, and faced on the internet with so much of trolling and harassment because of a fact that because of my social location that i am a black woman in a white white person's world dominant world where i am trying to really go ahead and assert my level of b all right so if that's clear we could go on to the next slide vidyasa yeah so now just quickly for people to just be sure what i explain some illustrative example let's look let's look at the first one a man goes through a breakup all right he feels angry and resentful so that's the motivation like i explained before he's angry and wants to make his ex partner's ex girlfriend or it could be in a casual relationship feel as hurt as he does so that's the intent that's the vengeance that they want to go for and he posts an intimate video which would have been taken in consensual spaces back then in the intimate space without her consent onto social media so that's the tactic that the person has used and then they use it to blackmail which is the behavior and so the ex partner ends up paying the man like listen do not i don't don't send it to anywhere my naked photos just just uh, provides the money so that's the help seeking or for that matter extortion now i could go on to the second one which is quite interesting uh, this is again from icrw a man living in a country where there are legal repercussion for the lgbti community uses an online networking um uh, networking site to arrange a meet up with another member however a police officer has infiltrated the site using a fake account which is again a behavior or tactic right and the officer passes the name along to anti gay vigilantes or maybe a religious group or maybe you know you community which is just out there and that's a motivation and then that what happens is that the uh, the meet up with him and severely beat him that's the impact so we see also a if you look at the whole 
aspect of it it starts online or the medium is some online form but could actually really shift into really um, like violence in the public and the private space so it really goes there again third one feminist journalist posts a blog threatening comments come from her wants to silence her and uh, again like under the weight of this emotional tension that she shuts down all her online accounts and in fact quits her job so there's an economic impact on the person is that clear to everyone i mean we could just skip to the next slide okay great thank you guys next slide yes great okay so now this is my final slide but i'm just going to like why have i bought this here because i come from this training of feminist social work i really want to want us to understand what is the women's control on the internet right and what is the correlation between all of this so women use of usage of technology is controlled and that is an extension to the social control that we women face in patriarchy in the offline world we are controlled in this we are physically there is a mobility restriction that happens in our life and that actually extends to the medium of online for example what picture you put on social media is controlled so now here there could be two example it could be your partner who's saying oh, why have you put a photo with that guy or why have you put this photo where i can see some part of your body which i do not like so there's a form of control whoever's in the dating space and feel that oh no he loves me and this is form of the love that he's showing on me no that's not correct that is actually abuse and that's a red flag for you if someone's trying to control what you're wearing or what you're doing online right it could also be the natal family what is natal family natal family is uh, where you're born like your biological family for example and they try to control you and say listen i do not want this whatsapp photo that you've put who is that person on whatsapp that you've put with the relatives or, or anyone in your family that is again a form of control that women uh, face when using technology second the surveillance or tracking that happens with women through apps there's something called life 360 i'm not sure there's that app or, or on or i know on the iphone where people say oh you know you could just switch on where you're going so i'll always know where you are and this is coming from care and this is coming from the fact that i romantically love you or we are your parents there's a huge difference between the protectionist ideology of patriarchy versus being protective about someone right so we need to be clear about that so when the women is online what photo she's like and yeah so i've explained this last but not the least i'm going to ask there is my this is my belief okay this is my belief i feel women are truly free on the internet oh no this is just the last yeah okay so women are truly free on the internet because there is information information is knowledge we can navigate romantic love we can navigate and know what's actually out there in a space if we are physically mobile uh, our mobility is restricted and through this dating app social media platform women often hide identity from native family because they don't want them that they are, uh, that they have some form of online presence so there is a restriction on your mobility and a, the way to actually socially control you even on the internet space so in fact what happens is with all this abuse and trolling and everything that happens now we tend to self censor ourselves right because we are like what do i want to put out as information out on the internet so my only question and this is where i end this with is then what does then a feminist internet space look like so thank you that's all yeah that's just the reference if anyone wants to visit where i picked everything from thank you so much shivangi that was that was a lot of information indeed and thank you so much for explaining to us also the channels <laughs> no this is this is exactly what we want and i'm pretty sure that there is a lot that people have to um would want to ask and also reflect on um now that we have a lot of uh, points to think about so if anybody has anything to add we now have the floor open for 2 minutes uh okay. so please raise your hand and we can go to you i think vivian had something to say hmm? yeah may i yes please vivian yeah uh, thank you uh, so much uh, for the, the very um uh useful uh, information and uh, presentation uh, uh, basically i just want to add about the impact uh of uh the uh about um uh, survivor or victims yeah uh i saw that uh, one of the uh, impact is actually in spiritual or religious uh thing yeah uh for example uh the victim or survivor sometimes they becoming like despondent of allah of uh, god's mercy on creation 
and also maybe a disappointment with faith leaders and uh, their teachings and this uh, despondency with religious texts and others so i saw uh, that uh, happen uh, because i have also some friends uh, uh, you know facing this uh, this uh, this as, as an impact of uh, the yeah thank you thank you vivin um we would now uh, move on to our next panelist uh, who is from one of our partner organizations and she's from Afghanistan. Uh, we'd like to introduce to you Ms. Farzana Bahaduri, who is the program coordinator for Afghan Women Welfare and Development Association. She is a BBA graduate from American University of Afghanistan and is a passionate individual who wants to contribute to human rights, women's rights, and that of gender equality. So over to you, Farzana. Um, good evening, everyone, and uh, warm greetings to all. Uh, I'm really uh, glad to be among you all. And uh, thanks from Jammu and Kashmir Policy Institute for conducting this event. Uh, so I'm going to shortly talk about a role of civil society organizations in combating gender-based violence. Um, civil society organizations have a critical uh, role in all uh, societies, especially when it comes to combating uh, the gender-based violence. Uh, combating the gender-based violence needs a meaningful and comprehensive strategy and mechanism that can include uh, the points that I'll be mentioning in a few minutes. Uh, so first of all, uh, I'll talk about uh, the raising awareness. Uh, civil society organizations uh, can have a charismatic role in raising awareness. Uh, raising awareness is an important strategy for uh, preventing and combating with gender-based violence. Um, in many conflict-affected countries, uh, young people and men do not know enough about uh, gender-based violence, and especially women, on uh, how to prevent it. Uh, it's necessary to start with raising awareness, and, and, and that is what AUDA is doing, Afghan Women Welfare and Development Association is doing in Afghanistan. Uh, so many of the gender-based violence arise from ignorance. So the more uh, civil society organizations contribute in raising awareness, the better it is for combating gender-based violence. And uh, uh, civil society organizations are always the best platform to contact with the grassroots level of the societies and transfer the message to them more directly. Um, and uh, civil society organization can uh, mainly combat uh, gender-based violence by raising awareness about different issues. In addition to that, uh, civil society organizations can be a great platform for reflecting and sharing the diverse voices of gender-based violence survivors to be heard publicly. Uh, it has been a norm in many societies to hide the stories of violence due to some kind of traditional beliefs and cultures, which can lead to many further uh, violences within the society. While sharing the stories of gender-based violence, especially from the uh, survivors uh, themselves, can open uh, a door uh, to better understanding of people, which I believe uh, the civil society organizations can have a major role in normalizing this phenomena. Uh, we can do that uh, through social media platforms, but of course it's necessary to take the sensitivity in mind. Um, as we all know that civil society organizations are one of the key contributors to the positive changes uh, to the societies, uh, so civil society organizations shall be assisted by the government in many different aspects in order to better elaborate the roles of civil society organizations. Uh, for instance, uh, the government uh, should support uh, civil society organizations to enable an environment where they can operate and participate in policy dialogue on gender-based violence. Uh, also, the government uh, shall facilitate civil society organizations to monitor uh, the implementation of the current laws more systematically. Uh, on the other hand, it's worth mentioning that uh, civil society organizations themselves uh, should develop lo the laws and the regulations internally and with their partners that are based on human rights and protects human rights, especially the rights of women. 
uh, civil society organizations uh, should be uh, enabled by government to monitor the laws uh, for protecting the rights of women. Um, and additionally, those laws or policies should benefit women and their rights in all aspects. I would like to add that uh, combating gender-based violence is a long-term commitment process which uh, requires a meaningful sustained uh, commitments and resources with civil society, which civil society organizations can have a very important role uh, through long-term meaningful commitment uh, while having the required resources and funds, which is not possible without having the national and international support, of course. Uh, civil society organizations can uh, prevent and combat gender-based violence through addressing uh, the root causes. I, as uh, um, Afghan Women Welfare and Development Association's uh, program coordinator can uh, express that civil society organizations really can affect the combating process of uh, gender-based violence uh, as we have had so many awareness programs, uh, trainings and capacity buildings in different pro provinces of Afghanistan with local and uh, grassroots people of the societies and and uh, provinces uh, and got a very good result so far. Um, a change is always felt right after the implementation of uh, programs or events in the understanding and reaction of the people to the issues that have already existed and people have responded uh, as of a norm. Uh, so civil society organizations can uh, uh, can have a significant role in combating gender-based violence when they're aided with supports and uh, suitable resources. Uh, so, um, and thank you for listening. If you have any question, I'm here uh, to respond. If anyone has any question, we would request you to hold it a little because we are going to be moving into our breakout rooms uh, very soon. We are going to have five breakout rooms in the order in which we've had our panelists share. So breakout room number one will be COVID-19 and GBV. Second breakout room is going to be domestic violence. Third one will be religion and gender-based violence. Fourth will be online abuse and gender-based violence. And the fifth is going to be uh, the civil society organizations and youth organizations in combating gender-based violence. Now, we would give, want you to take a, all take a five minutes break in which I would request our uh, participants to kindly uh, mention your name and the number one, two, three, four, or five so that we can put you in a breakout room where you would want to discuss any particular dimension of the issue further. So uh, we would um, want your cooperation and also would like you to take a minute to breathe and process all the information that our brilliant panelists had already shared. So break time and it's one, two, three, four, five. So I'll just mention uh, in the chat box, one is COVID-19 GBV. Number two is domestic violence. Our panelists are going to be in each of the groups, but this is more of a group uh, where the participants would get to contribute and speak about um, what they think and add, add to the uh, discussion, maybe even ask questions that you did not get a chance to ask before. So please feel free to let us know which group you'll be joining after five minutes. We're just going to have a breakout room for around 20 minutes. We are running short of time. So 20 to 25 minutes at the max. And please use this uh, opportunity to also network. of the breakout room you wish to be in. Thank you.
Ele tem onde? Kindly mention in the chat box because it uh, we are manually putting people in the groups, so it'll be very helpful for us. Thank you. to mention and reiterate that um, we are going to be every input that you provide or every part of the discussion is going to be included in our sessions report. same I'm waiting for the others to mention because accordingly I am dividing the groups so the sooner we get to do this the sooner we jump into the breakout rooms For those who haven't responded yet, I will just put people randomly. So I hope that's all right. And we hope to have an interesting discussion. Ranalini, you want to join another group? <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. But I was hoping that you would be our expert in the first group. All right. Um, 
One more suggestion. Um, all right, Varuni has something to say before moving to the breakout rooms. I would like to share some important point. We discussed database balance in various perspectives, but we missed the soft tools which molding GBV in thousand ways, society language. Culture and social behavior would be considered as the soft tools which make GBV in debatable dialogue. All right, so um, there seems to be uh, perspectives coming up which people want to share in the plenary. So um, I would just want to ask, because we are, we have overshot the time and we have around 20, 25 minutes more. So would you want to have an open plenary dialogue or do you want to go for a breakout room? So we could also consider tweaking things a little bit. So let me know what everyone would want. So this is a last minute change of plans because I see Varuni has something to say and I wonder if others have to. So can I please have a few people tell me whether or not the breakout rooms would be more convenient for you or would you like to just discuss in the open plenary? All right. So I see that people want to do an open plenary discussion. That's wonderful. So then uh, we are canceling the breakout rooms as a last minute um, participants choice and um, we'll be facilitating an open discussion. For this facilitation, I would uh, wish to invite um, any one of the facilitators who are going to facilitate to volunteer uh, for this part of the plenary discussion. So who will be facilitating? Guys, we always work in an open, voluntary, and democratic way. So please, okay. all the facilitators, let me know who wants to facilitate this session. Okay, so let me show ahead. All right. Over to you, Tamina. Yeah, I think my voice is uh, reaching late. Yes, your yes. network is a little off. It's just so. a little distorted along with okay. the video. Okay. So I'll try to speak slowly so that it doesn't get disrupted in between. So hi, yeah, I'm Ina Rizvi from JKPI. Uh, I have listened to all the speakers here and uh, I totally second to everyone's thoughts who have shared uh, their uh, important things, what particularly they believe or at large what we, we as women have to do. Uh, as far as domestic violence, uh, Sub has uh, described, I would like to add to that, that women have been the best distributors of patriarchy since ages. Men are on the back foot of that when we talk about patriarchy. And now as we, all of us are here, we have seen that sometimes women can be women's best friend. Sometimes she can be the worst enemy because she's her worst critique times. And it is only our mothers and sister mother-in-laws in the households who have taught us to remain silent during the domestic violence. You rarely a father or a brother telling you that if your husband beats you or if someone is just slapping you around, don't talk about it. It is always the lady of the house who will tell you to tolerate because I have tolerated. And it is going on from ages. And I was personally so happy to listen to this because usually I see women don't come forward and talk about it. And I was very, I would say I was just stunned for something after listening uh, to what Subh has went through. But after that end point, when we uh, came around the discussion, it gave me a ray of hope that how all of us in our in our lives can just 
uh, raise our voice against everything which happens. The instance you see in your life, whether it's eve teasing and whether domestic violence, you should just get up and speak about it. Regarding um, Shivangi's uh, this presentation, I would say there are some particular points which we didn't know that this is also considered as gender-based violence in all the platforms. That has been very enlightening for us. And I am totally welcoming everyone who just wants to jump in and add their points, feel whatever you feel, because now when we have totally moved towards an open platform, we would love to have everyone's feelings around. So yeah, thank you everyone. And thank you JTI too, how our male members have just been there for our support and put us for on the forefront of it. That's how we even women empowerment. Thank you. Anyone who wants to join in, share the things. So thank you. Um, thank yeah. you, Katrina, for um, acknowledging and hearing me out. It means a lot. And yes, it is a fact. There's no fact less than the, the, the one I'm going to quote is, trust me, when you're on your own, when you have no savior, you're at your best. And that is when you can do best. Because then you have nothing else but God and yourself to rely on. And that is the beauty and purity of it, you know? Because when it comes to humans, we still have doubts in something. But when, when it comes to God, the source, you know, the, 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 you know, the divine protector, and then when it comes to ourselves, that is where we don't want to have doubts, you know, because we're a little selfish like that. So it's the best when we waste no time waiting for someone to come and save us. We be our own hero and we be our own saviors and we watch our own backs. Totally, I agree to your point. Anyone, anyone wants to share their thoughts? The floor is open. Virtual floor, I would say. Those are, those are allowed to jump in. Yeah. I'm really sorry. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you very much. I'm really sorry I just cut some people. I didn't realize. Uh, I have a question. Is, is a question or should I say is curiosity to know certain things more? Uh, it's related to Shivangi's presentation where you mentioned about a term that is called gender trolling. So could you please emphasize more on this particular aspect of gender trolling? Because I get this is something which really, you know, uh, got me into the thing that what is exactly means? Because we have been focusing more on women. And you did mention about the LGBT community, but exactly what the term means? Because it's, just some, it's something that have been, like, I'm seeing for the very first time. So could you please emphasize more yeah. on that? Yeah. So Jigyasa, thank you for that question. Uh, it could mean, and I believe that's what it means, is that, uh, for example, uh, individuals from the trans community, for example, trans women uh, getting harassed or trolled, for example, maybe um, uh, someone who's transitioning wearing a sari, a man wearing a sari, a cis man wearing a sari, or a trans woman wearing a sari. So that really comes out and like people troll, oh, why are you doing that? Because people are trying to fix people to their uh, particular gender, which in their head is their particular sex. And they do not, they do not, they believe that there are only two genders. So precisely why there's a lot of trolling regarding that. So yeah, I believe that's what it meant. Hi, I'd like to come in and uh, I'd like to speak more about the youth organization in combating uh, gender-based violence. Uh, we've had some amazing women and, you know, they've shared their stories. And this has also made us, you know, realize the need of building safe spaces if we need to 
counter gender-based violence. For this, um, I don't think we will be having a networking session. So this is the perfect time for, you know, for me to sort of reach out to all of you, uh, women, especially working in conflict areas, conflict zones, if you would require any assistance and help through Winds of Creativity or Jammu and Kashmir Policy Institute, please feel free to reach out to us because we are determined to work in these areas and we would be more than happy to assist you in whichever way possible. Anyone? Uh, any, I'd uh, like to jump in a bit. And thank you so much, uh, Geeta Vaishnavi, for sharing this. And uh, I particularly found your the work you do amazing with the children, the educative purpose. So I think besides the youth organizations, the work you're doing is so important. And we should really think of policies where we integrate awareness about GMV into educational curriculums of children so that it's not only girl children who are told be on your guard, but young male children, they grow up knowing that these roles are socially constructed and you should respect differences. But violence is not okay. Maybe, maybe they can take that knowledge back to their home, even if they come from different backgrounds where there's conflict at home, maybe they can take this knowledge back and make a difference. Thank you so much uh, for acknowledging my work. And yes, what you pointed out is very important. I feel uh, there has to be solutions in intersection with policy, uh, you know, keeping in mind when we're forming policy. Uh, if you've read uh, the current uh, education policy which was published, it has a very key role for arts to be played in. And that is why what I try to do is I always sort of try to blend art with education when I'm trying to teach children. And it's a complete hit. I feel uh, kids are just graviated naturally towards arts. And it's one of the best ways to, if you want to, you know, teach them something, uh, especially children who are from low income families, you know, their, their parents don't have money uh, to buy food at night, you know, they, they wouldn't splurge money on buying them, you know, colors or sketchbooks and stuff. But this is important. This is important because it's one of the, I feel it's a, it's the simplest way to express your emotion, you know, give a child crayons, tell them what they're feeling and, you know, they will speak to you from their heart. So thank you so I, much. I, I'd just like to share an experience because I totally get what you're saying. I used to work in my university with, a slum, with slum kids and once I, it was a, a sort of supposed to be a woman's week, but there were children. Many of the mothers had come with children. So, and there was some free time. So I bought pencils uh, to, uh, I think we were working on environment. So we gave the mothers pencils and we told, this is the time you bond with your children. You uh, sort of re sort of uh, slice off the pencils and do art with the pencils, uh, pencil cut. And it led to a beautiful time between the mother and children in areas where they don't really get that. And sort of, I think somehow bonding in ways with your mother, which does, or which, does not is not limited to them feeding you or sort of cast them into the roles that life casts them makes you see them in different light as well and sort of teaches you to not normalize them as objects to be exploited and sort of and to make you value them differently and i also wanted to raise another issue that's some that's got to do with religion and i was wondering what role can interfaith dialogue do in combating gender based violence because i think the, uh, i mean even of course beautifully pointed out ele elements in islam that can be used against sort of uh, against fighting GMV, but I'm sure there are elements which can be used to also combat GMV. And I'm sure every religion plays this ambivalent role where many male leaders have sort of misinterpreted religion to sort of ex make excuses and enable GMV. But then I'm sure there's a big role that Sort of talking about this issue in a very interfaith manner can sort of bring about solutions at every level. Um, yes, like uh, women pointed out that Islam was the first religion to um, uh, have worked on uh, women's rights and women's 
uh, place, uh, you know, significance and woman's place in, uh, you know, in every uh, aspect of a man's life and the world. Um, but you know what, uh, our human rights, I mean, uh, if we talk about UK, because that is definitely uh, one country welfare state that is really uh, rigid on their human rights. That is looking out for women equally as good. And uh, they've taken the inspiration from the religion, right? So if, if you, since, you know, uh, religions and Hinduism and Islam, it's not going to be easy for us to accept KR, un, unke hume ideas we have to implement and stuff. So, you know, maybe take it from the other direction. Maybe dig into what human rights have uh, said about women, because they're the same thing. They've taken the inspiration from Islam, and that is how they're implementing it in uh, welfare states out there. So I think that is going to be one thing that's going to work. But um, again, the silent GBVs are still going to exist and they're going to continue to exist, unfortunately, until and unless uh, women and men and everyone vulnerable out there know that they have to say no and you know mark their parameters for it. So human rights it is. Uh, I just wanted to add something to what so so just said. If I'm going to answer that right, uh, I think it's also essential for us to maybe, and I could be very radical in my thinking. I'm just stating it out there. But uh, what, like, if you look at, I'm I'm going to talk in the sense of domestic violence. But if you look at what is the role of religion, right, and religion, and what is what they're trying to reiterate that there's an importance of family, right. So that there's family and that the breaking of family should not happen. And that is something I feel that's across religion, could be Islam, could be Hinduism, could be Christianity, that they, they really want the family to stay together, right? So, I mean, um, how do we then critically engage with all religion to look at how empowered are we as women in any religion? I mean, I mean I'm coming from that space, like just, just putting it out there. Um, exactly. may, are, yeah, may I add? Yeah, women is going to comment on that better. Uh, may I add something uh, regarding uh, the interfaith? Absolutely, women, please go ahead. All right, thank you so much. Thank you for uh, raising this uh, issue. Uh, uh, what's the name? Alkamitra. Um, hmm. Yeah, Akamitra, <laughs> thank you so much. So uh, yeah, basically, um, because um, I founded the Interfaith Women Community uh, here in 2015, and um, in facing the COVID-19 uh, this uh, beginning May until, uh, I think until October, uh, we had uh, mental and spiritual health support uh, program uh, one of the activity uh, is serial seminars on how uh, we as a, um, uh, as a human can also uh, support uh, in mental and spiritual health. Uh, from these um, seminars, actually, uh, we found that uh, gender-based violence and also um, mental health issues become one of uh, the common concern that uh, every uh, you know, a religion, every faith uh, should face together. So uh, what I can, uh, in short, that if we talk about interfaith uh, dialogue uh, in action, uh, basically we are uh, trying to face the common problem, uh, the common uh, uh, issue. So one of the common issue uh, in terms of uh, women issue is actually gender-based violence, for example, uh, some of our participants of seminar of uh, participant of the seminars there are they had a uh, uh, very bad experience uh, even when they talk in the seminar and then seminar is actually our seminar actually uh, uh, on zoom uh, then and you and more than 70 uh, participants uh, and uh, once uh, almost one, 120 participants and uh, we shared it in our Facebook online. You can also check, but it's in, in Indonesian. Some of participants even they crying when they when they share their experience uh, because because uh, because of the gender based violence. So I think uh, this is very important that if we talk about interfaith dialogue, try to 
uh, work uh, to face the common uh, issue. Thank you. Thank you so much, everybody. I just wanted to jump in and uh, Shubh, I totally agree with what you said, and of course, Shivangi, but then there is all, I'm not, uh, I'm, I don't see it as human rights versus religion at all, but but then there can be situations in in a political context that you you go to the grassroots, you tell people that this is your human right, basic human right. They are going to tell you, but then that is alien. I my religion does not talk about anything like that because they don't know that version of religion where the hum concept of human rights comes from Islam itself. Or I can talk in the context of Hinduism. In an average, the idea is yeah, the Devi is to be worshipped, but Manu says that women are servants to men. But then I, there are exceptions to it. I have a female Guruji and then the way she taught that everybody is equal is, by, is, is through anecdotes and through the way she treated everybody as equal. So uh, what I'm saying is there are ways of teaching beyond preaching that tells you that these concepts are coming from your own tradition itself it respects your difference but that your the, your identity but then it also gives you an equality at all levels so i think mystical traditions which all the mystical traditions talk of equality at certain level i think i again go back to and this is hosted by jk policy institute i'll go back to lal Dev. so i think mysticism has a big role to play in popular culture in and uh, somebody did point out the role of soft tools like culture so i think i think our mystical traditions every religion has very rich mystical traditions which talk about equality of all so i think these have a very important role in combating these issues i can't um help myself from uh, jumping in at this point um what i wanted to uh, elaborate on that um you know orkamitra rightly pointed out is that when we look at um, the concept of violence there is also a cultural element to it so in many cultures we see that a lot the concepts of violence that we are talking about a lot of it is not considered violence according to certain cultures it's normalized primarily because the way faith traditions uh, and, uh, you know, the lifestyle within a culture evolves, suiting itself to uh, how conveniently a community moves through obstacles and the circumstances and structures are formed and imposed over time, or they evolve. Uh, there is a constant shift and there is no one way of looking at it. So as this, that, is, that is, I think, what makes it um, a difficult thing to talk about. And whenever we look at violence, and when Shubh was mentioning that, uh, you know, uh, it's all up to us to say that no, right? But that no comes from an awareness of your cultural agency. And that is a narrative that is yet to come about. I mean, everybody talks about opportunities. Everybody talks about uh, you know, uh, you know, we have reservations, we have opportunities handed to um, women out there on a plate sometimes because we want an equal space, but that choice to actually take it, to actually access those services, to say a no, to do all of these things, to come up and do that, that strength and that motivation which drives us has something to do with uh, being limited by our sense of cultural agency at homes, in our workspaces, in our educational centers, everywhere we are taught um, as women that a particular role is more important than our individuality. And that is where I think it is a struggle. I mean, being someone, uh, being a woman who's um, trying to work um, in a space where not many women have led, and I know that many of you are attempting to do that brave work yourself, I know that one thing that we struggle with is being a woman and being a leader or being a professional at the same time. 
some of us often dewomanize ourselves in order to be seen as individuals but you would notice that men don't exactly have to do that they can comfortably be men and at the same time the professional or the leader or whatever is it the role that they are playing but for us we have to prove that extra point and it's not just for women that i speak of course the lgbtq community also struggles probably a lot more than women or pretty much along the same lines but at a at a more um at a you can say at a greater level so i think the discussion of violence mm -hmm. is something that that the word violence has the whole idea of violation mm -hmm. and that violation is has a lot to do with the boundaries we set and the boundaries that are defined for us that is taught to us that we're conscious of that we are aware of and as long as that narrative doesn't change with education whether be it religious education whether be it our community education whether be it our political education whether be it our uh, personal personality development our personal education every form of education that we women are taught we are never taught about boundaries we are never taught about uh, our sense of agency when it comes to what is it that we draw from our culture that allows us to do something we are told what not to do and all of this i think inhibits us from taking that step like shubh said that you have to take that step to say a no to actually stand up and say that you know what this is it this is the boundary you cannot you cannot allow somebody to encroach that and it's okay to do that and that is the most important aspect now that is what you see all around you and like shivangi rightly said it's extended to the online space and the online space actually makes it easier to violate someone's privacy and as we get more and more connected it is ever so important for not just men but women as well to understand the gender roles are made have been invented to serve a particular purpose but beyond that purpose as the roles change as society evolves a lot of things have to shift as well so given that i think this is a discussion which uh, merits uh, obviously more time uh, but last but not the least we would we would like to hear from the men we have taken up a lot of space and time but there are some men who have been silently and very patiently listening to all of us vent and share and give us give all the information that we have um they've given us a safe space and we are grateful for that but we would love to close this discussion uh by inviting the men in this group in this wonderful group to uh volunteer to share their feedback input any reflections that they may have based on what we've been sharing so you know we haven't forgotten the men yeah we always know that um i, I would like to share something it's it's a uh, it's an honor for me to be here and listen to what's uh, troubling you or what's uh, going on in your part of the world in the women's world indeed because um i was just picking up a point as you just mentioned here shini uh, about women having women having to fight more for their positions um that comes solely because it's not a position you have been given uh well it is you have been giving it it's not something that men have thought of oh no we have to divide things into this and that it's something like it has been granted like a law of necessity okay women have to be put in this position so men have not been taught to give equal space to women they've just been told that they have to and therefore there will always be this underlying um, at least in some part of the world sense of women men thinking that women are not able to hold that space even though they have to give it to them So I believe that, uh, from my perspective, working with the youth or youth organizations like the Scouts, where we have clear and very strict safe from harm policies that enables children and young people to know about everything that has to go on about gender equality, human rights, violence, and but not least gender violence, and also the online type, indeed, um, teaching is. Super important. It has to start from the next generation. It's difficult to teach the elder generation to do anything different. They'll just be stubborn and say, "This is it. This is the way." So we can <laughs> take the kids from now and teach them how to do things differently. Show them. Don't just talk about it. 
but show them in action, walk the talk, um, and then they can change things. It will take a lot of time. I know that. You can take my space anytime. I don't mind. But it's been great being here and listening to what you have to say. I can take a lot of this with me into my work promoting the, the, the real rights for, for women in this world. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, John. John. Hello, everyone. Hello. Hi, Varuni. Am I audible? Yes, you are. I'm really sorry that I couldn't open my video. So I, I would like to add something about the uh, gender-based violence. Actually, we were talking about many things, many perspectives, how gender-based violence could be happen and what are the uh, root causes and how we can prevent those things and everything. But I think we, uh, we need to uh, focus on the soft tools which were uh, lying behind of this uh, issue. So in here, language and also culture and the social behaviors, those are the three uh, key areas that I have highlighted. I wanted to highlight at this uh, uh, discussion because when when it's come to the language, language is the th language is the mechanism that how we are expressing ourselves to the world how uh, we are understanding our society. So as I know, and as I experienced, uh, as I learned in every language, we have female and the male versions for every word. So that is where this gender-based violence, I, I believe that is where this gender-based violence are starting. So of course, there should be female and the male versions. We cannot change that, but if we can think about this female and male versions as a unique as a unique icon so i think that would be uh, very important uh, to prevent the gender based violence it mean so let's take an example we are uh, we call it male and the female of course they have two basic two different identities but in common we all are human behaviors human beings so if we can think about, if we can uh, consider female and the male are as a unique human being. So I think most of the gender-based violence would be uh, controlled and the prevented. So I think the uh, most important thing is the change in ideologies of the people. It is a challenge because people uh, do not want to accept the changes. People do not like to accept changes. So if we really wanted to uh, prevent the gender-based violence, of course, that is one thing we need to address. And also when it's come to language, when it's come to culture, everyone has, everyone experiencing diversity of the cultures. So, but in every cultures, we are sharing the common things. We can consider about this common platform. We can promote this common, common platform to protect gender gender rights so everyone has rights and uh, as usually worlds are uh, respecting each and individual rights so through the cultural things through the soft diplomatic tools we can uh, prevent this gender based violence not but we cannot totally prevent the gender based violence because that is how the world is going on so i uh, i believe if we can change the ideologies, if we can uh, take, if we can uh, consider about these soft tools, of course, we will be able to somehow minimize the gender-based violences. Thank you, Sahini. Thank you so much, Varuni. That is indeed true. Uh, couldn't have agreed more with you, but we do believe that this whole transformation will happen one step at a time as we address the different aspects of it. And as um, young women and men who are advocates for a more equal world that they step in to uh, you know, um, bring all of these elements into consideration while 
we are designing policies, while we are defining structures, and how we go about negotiating our space mm -hmm. in a post-COVID mm -hmm. uh, world mm -hmm. that that is so very connected with through the internet and the knowledge economy and everything else. So uh, we would, uh, as much as we would love to continue this conversation, it is time for us to um, end this uh, particular forum. Thank you so much, everyone, our um, panelists, our guest speaker, Ms. Supriya Singh Chauhan, our um, keynote speaker and partner, Ms. Geeta Vaishnavi, and um, all of you who've made this a massive success and the amount of information that we have gathered, uh, it is going to be a very informative report indeed. So thank you all for participating. And most of all, thank you to uh, the team of uh, ADA, of the Euphrates Institute, of Jammu and Kashmir Policy Institute and Winds of Creativity for putting together the campaign and this forum. We couldn't have done this without each and every one of you. Thank you so much. And with that, we, um, I would request somebody from the uh, team, uh, from my team to please take a screenshot of uh, everyone. Uh, so if you can, please um, kindly uh, put on your video so that we can have a nice group photo. Uh, Jigyasa Tosif, one of you can please take the screenshot. So we will, we hope to have everyone on, on the screen. Hang on, why can't I see everyone? Um, can we please have your videos on so that we can have a nice group photo? All right, so whoever is online and on video, we are right here for the photo. Tosif, Jigyasa, can one of you please take the photo and let us know when it's done? I don't think the gas is here. I can't see her. I think there is a connection issue that's happening. Uh, in that case, I will request, please, anyone from the team to do this. And please mention, because I'm very confused who's here and who's not. Yeah. Emina, are you able to do it? Yeah, I'll just take a screenshot from the Zoom thing. Yes. It. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Uh, we look forward to more such forums, and we look forward to all of you connecting with us again. Please stay connected, stay safe, and have a good night. Thank you. Have a good night.